2020, I think, is a crossroad for our county. Uh, we've seen uh, great growth, great economic prosperity, but we have challenges. We have challenges if we want to sustain that. Transportation, workforce housing, environmental issues, economic development, and uh, by the way, they're all kind of intertwined to each other. But if we want to sustain Miami-Dade County into the future, uh, these are issues that need to be addressed today in an aggressive fashion, in a transparent fashion, and I think I'm the person that's most qualified because basically I've been working on these issues now for the last eight years while I've been serving in the commission. Well, some could argue that if you've been working on them for the last eight years and they're not getting better, are you really the best person then to turn around? And I would also say that some of those other commissioners would say they been working on these issues. So what differentiates yourself? Well, the reality is that, and, and we'll take transportation for example, transportation was a moot issue in Miami-Dade County until 2013 when I became the chair of the Transportation Committee and we started actually tackling the problem. We felt frustrated like many residents in Miami-Dade that with the half penny, we didn't see the development in transportation, the expansion that we thought we were going to be seeing definitely by that time. And in all honesty, if we don't start talking about it and we start realizing that the half penny wasn't enough money and we needed more money, we needed to figure out other ways of being able to do it, I don't think we even have this conversation. And I will tell you that actually we've moved the dial from a funding standpoint, the fact that we have Uber and Lyft now, freebies in a lot of the communities, trolleys, all this product of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years. So you bring up the half penny sales tax mm -hmm. for transportation for folks who don't remember because we have a lot of new people coming we in. Do. We do. You know, this was an initiative that was put forward by Alex Pinellas. Did Alex Pinellas sell us a bill of goods as to what the half penny was going to deliver? Snake oil, basically. We. You think it was just pure? Did he know it at the time he was selling a snake oil? Not only did he know it, uh, all the reports and indicators showed it, and in fact, uh, he made statements quickly after that. If he would have known all these facts, he probably wouldn't have pushed forward through it. Look, the problem was that we overpromised. Uh, there was a huge reach for voters by giving them things that many don't don't use. And I'll give an example: the mover in downtown Miami, fantastic for the ones that live there. It's free. The PTP pays for it, but does nothing for the residents in Westchester, Homestead, or Northwest Dade, where I represent. And on and on it went. The, the promises made. The sharing with the cities. Fantastic for the cities, but at 20%, we've almost given them quarter of almost $275 million to cities to implement transit plans in their cities. And just, and just again, just to bring people up to date on what you're talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. you know, one of the selling points was to get buy-ins from the cities to promote it among their constituents when this was voted on, I can't remember, what year was the 2000? 2002, if, two? I, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. I think, yeah. So 17 years ago at least, was that 20% of the money would go to local municipalities. And we've seen a lot of questions as to how some of those have spent that money? Well, at first they were spending it by building sidewalks and roads and, and kind of like street beautification. Now they're implementing it, I think, in a better way with trolleys that give folks different options. But let's make no mistake, all this was political buy-offs. You know, 20% of the cities gets mayors from all these cities on board. Uh, the Golden Passport, nobody was asking for it at the time. And look, it's a very popular program. I don't it's, think a thing for, it's something for, for seniors, seniors to ride free. Exactly. And then they added the Patriot program for those that are veterans. All these are good things. I'm not complaining about those issues. The problem is that as you started diluting the money, you started realizing you're not going to have enough money to fulfill this expansion or mass expansion of Metro Rail, and that's, therefore now we have this issue that affects our quality of life. Well, my understanding is, is that Alex Pinellas plans on running on transportation. You know, so what would you say if uh, you are end up in a runoff? Because the way this works is we have a very crowded field, mm -hmm. which we'll meet in August. If no Nobody gets 50% of the vote in August, then it goes to a runoff in November. And I think with such a crowded field, we're anticipating this is probably headed towards a runoff. Is Alex Pinellas your main competition? And if he is, what's your message against him? And I raise that only because he's going to raise a lot of money in this race. Well, first and foremost, County Hall should not be for sale. So it doesn't really matter how much money you raise. What is more important here is to have a transparent dialogue. And I respect all the opponents that are running in this race. I think they're all very decent people. And all of us, I think, have visions that we'd like to carry out. Uh, but I will tell you this, Jim, this county can't go backwards. We got to continue to move forward in this county. And to me, to bring back uh, 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 ideas of past centuries really are not going to work as far as I'm concerned. We have a very dynamic community that expects real solutions and I would tell you not only are we ready to engage on these issues, we've been doing it now for a while. I, so let's uh, 
I think a lot of people tend to divide transparency into you're in one of two camps. Mm -hmm. You're in either the bus camp or the sure. rail camp. How, is it, where, are you a bus guy or a rail guy? Look, I'm, I'm, I've been a rail proponent from day one, and I think we need to expand rail. There's a lot of... It's very expensive. It is expensive, and there's good predictability and development opportunities with rail. But let's make no mistake, if you do not get the ridership and the density in order to build the ridership that you need, you're not going to get federal help. And make no mistake, we do not have the money to be able to do it alone. You need federal partners. Also public-private partnerships. We see now this is starting to play in this space where the private vendors come and put money up front. Some of them are on rail, some of them are looking at buses, but you're going to have, and I've said this many times, in our smart corridor plans, you're going to see a mixture of different methods of transportation. It may be Brightline in the Northeast, it may be bus in the South, it may be rail in the North. Uh, the reality, though, is that we need to be honest with folks Tell them how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to maintain, how much it's going to cost to operate, and then we could go ahead and move forward. I want to raise one issue that gets raised about you sometimes, and I want to give you a chance to address it sure. so that we can talk about it. When you were chair of the county commission, mm -hmm. you caught some grief from a number of people who thought that, that you shut down conversations, that when people came up to the podium to speak to the commission, you had their mics turned off, you had police remove them out. Mm -hmm. If they were saying things that, that you may not have liked hearing, from the from the dais um, you know you did it under the under decorum but I want to play one example this sure. was a woman who who appeared before the Commission after Hurricane Irma and there was a lot of concern that as a result of the hurricane that folks in housing projects but, but that the county controls weren't getting ice where their insulin was going bad they weren't getting food mm -hmm. and so she was criticizing the response to Hurricane Irma and was specifically calling out the mayor mayor Jimenez at the time let's play that the events of the past week have demonstrated that the mayor has failed to adequately plan and protect the most vulnerable communities. Pre-storm, we asked the mayor to ensure that federal, state, and county resources are allocated and available. Do we, do we, let's, Why'd you cut off her mic? We have rules of decorum in our meetings. Everyone that comes to our meetings, and many of those are habituals that come to our meetings, understand that we have rules of decorum. The moment we start breaking away to turn into personal insults or try to make personal attacks of these issues, all I was doing there was pausing her and asking her just kind of refocus. If, if it turns into an attack on a mayor or an attack on one of my colleagues, it starts to degenerate. Now, we've had other folks come and literally insult members of the dais by calling us Nazis, dictators, and I, while I it may be that. a space in democracy, if we have rules of decorum, we need to follow those rules of decorum. And I'm with decorum. you on that. If somebody were uses profanity or bad mm -hmm. name calling, she was just saying the mayor failed. If you're elected mayor and someone steps forward and says, I think you failed, would you want their mic shut down as well? Well, I think what you've, you've probably not seen in this video is that at that meeting, we had other instances that people came to try to incite. Now, perhaps in that, in that portion there, what you may not know or the viewers are not seeing is that we've already had incidents of folks that had come up and tried to incite, and all I did was shut a pause her. If the video rolls, chances are she continued making she did. her statement. She did continue, mm -hmm. but it's a, there's a chilling effect, and I just, I mean, this is going to be an issue that I think you're going to hear from some sure. critics, and so I want to give you a chance to respond to it. I, I, I want to move on to some of the of other, other subjects that we've got. Um, do you, as I outlined before, this is going to be a race to sort of, I think, to see who gets in the runoff in November. Right. Do you see this, even though this is a nonpartisan race, do you view yourself as a, as a Republican candidate in this race and trying to attract Republicans to support you? Because a lot of the other candidates in the race are more on the Democratic side. Do you see uh, an, uh, an issue or a, a chance to sort of divide the electorate that way? Jim, I'm, I'm a Republican, but at the same time when I was a chair of the Board of County Commission, I tackled all nonpartisan issues. In fact, I became the chair of the Board of County Commission with majority Democrat support to make me the chair, not Republicans. Look, the services that the county provides are not blue or red. They're not defined by conservative or, uh, or uh, liberal. The county uh, taxpayer, the business owner, expects services to be rendered. And I think the functions of the mayor of the county is to make sure that in our budget process, we are adhering to the services that they want most, police, fire, 
But do you see yourself issues. as a Republican candidate in this race? Well, well I'm, a, I'm a Republican, but I'm a candidate for this race. And okay. by the way, I've served in nonpartisan capacities when I was in the city of Hialeah and since I've been on the Board of County Commission. But I am 